Hello and welcome back to the Battlefront studio in Auckland and we're sitting down again for a second time with my friend and co-worker Wayne to talk about this time oil war. How are you Wayne? I'm good, thank you. And uh, we have a few questions from Facebook that people have sent in over the weekend. Yes. And just like last time with our Great War q and I'm going to queue and you are going to answer. Yes. All right, fantastic. Let's get into it. Okay. So our first question is from Craig Melville. What do you think is the most unique piece of kit in oil war, Wayne? Uh, I think it's the Para, which is the weird Israeli anti-tank guided missile launcher that disguises a tank and it fires non line of sight missiles. Disguised as a tank. Yeah. So it's but based on an old tank on an M48. All oh, right, the uh, Para. Yep, yep. What's the M48 called when the? Um, it's a Magak. That's the one, Magak. Three or five? I can't remember the number. You wrote the book. Yeah, but we don't have any of those in the book because they're older. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then there's no need. Uh, and Kenneth Alexander has posed that question to both of us for the why. Why is that your favourite? Um, yeah, I just I think because it, it's got a unique bunch of rules involved with it. It's got the non line of sight. Missile, so you don't actually have to see have a line of sight on the table to that from the vehicle to the target vehicle. So you can oh. just go, I'm going to shoot that, and it will fire in the air, and it's got a, like a a little camera in it, and the guy controlling it will just look for the target. Oh, it's an ATGM. Yeah. I for some reason thought it was an anti-air. No, no, no. It's an. Anti- That's way cooler. Yeah. Okay, and my favorite piece of equipment is the T72 because it's just such a unique piece of kit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alan Haskane, what caused the decision to have Iranian lists be company based, unlike all previous uh, Red Four lists? Well, basically, how they're organised. Uh, the, the Iranians have a legacy of being trained by the Americans before the revolution, right? And so, the, the, a lot of their tank companies and stuff were trained by who supplied them. So, in the case of the M60s, they were you know, organised like that. Because they have, they have American equipment, they have British, British equipment, equipment, they and have American. German like small arms. Um, so a whole mix. Yeah, and, they, and then they also brought Soviet equipment, even under the Shah, like they brought uh, Shilkers and I think some uh, BTR sixties and some other bits and pieces under the Shah, and then later under the after the revolution they were buying. North Korean that was actually, and Chinese stuff. Yeah. That was going to be my follow-up question. Did they buy anything after the revolution? Yeah, and then they also used a lot of captured Iraqi stuff as well. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is a lot of Iraqi stuff comes from China, North Korea, and um, and uh, Soviet Union as well. Yeah. So it's kind of, they, their, their, their purchasing pool yeah. definitely was limited to anti-Western arms suppliers pretty much yes right that makes sense once once the revolution happened the Ameri- americans and the british stopped supplying them pretty much yeah, yeah well uh william white asks if you were going to build an oil war or maybe you already have uh which army would slash did you pick i was gonna have a look at uh chieftains because uh um for the iranians because i like the idea of running a kind of british style equipment with a um with that are not as well trained a little bit crapper <laughs> it's just a slightly worse version of the yeah gives me an opportunity to paint some uh, chieftains in a different color as well Righto, righto. nico santos if you already have multiple armies both warpack and nato from the previous team yankee books what makes the new oil war armies unique besides the new tank uh kits and models which are for the israelis uh, that would convince you to start a new army. Oh well, well, I mean, you know, is he, if, we, if we're discounting the Israelis, because the Israelis got a whole mix of their own cool stuff and mm-hmm. kind of kind of cool themselves. Both the Iraqis and the Iranians offer an interesting mix of training and equipment that mm-hmm. makes them a bit u- unique and different from anything that's in Eastern or Western Europe. So yeah, I think I think they offer some interesting like com- combinations of training and equipment. You know, because of uh, Iraqis have got, you know, as well as having former Soviet or Chinese copies of Soviet equipment, mm-hmm. they've got French stuff and Brazilian stuff. The Iran- Brazilian stuff. Yeah, there's a few, few of the few of the bits and pieces came from Brazil. Oh, really? Like what? Um, oh, some of the some of the small numbers of like armored cars and things they used. Oh. We've we've just said to use the BRDM two, mm-hmm. but 
a lot of those were operationally were the very similar Hungarian um, FUG and also they used some like um, Brazilian built armor cars that had a very similar role as well. Oh. And they also had some Brazilian APCs that were kind of just weird little four wheel armored trucks. Right. Things like that. So yeah. things from all over the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. And so theoretically, if I have multiple armies, both Warpack and NATO, as Nico Santos puts it, I can just just buy the oil war book and then rifle through my armies and maybe slap down a... Yeah, you could do that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also if you've uh, done any stuff to do with Fate of the Nation, that, oh, yes. uh, so if you've run Syrians or uh, Egyptians, you could probably repurpose those to be yeah. Iraqis if you want to, or as actual Syrians by yeah. using the Iraqi list, yeah. Ah, so yeah, so in many ways it just gives you a whole lot of extra bang for your models or it gives you the chance to... To do something, to do something new. Yeah, odd and different. From scratch. Um, so Bob Anderson asks, Oil War is the sixth full book since the launch of Team Yankee. Rules for ERA have been present since the game was first released, yet no tanks currently in the Team Yankee universe carry it. Magark 6 tanks had it during the 1982 war. Is the exclusion of ERA equipped tanks a game design choice or are there modeling issues that are preventing the release of the tanks? It's more uh, modeling issues because we wanted to um, make it easier for people to, to field their Magak 6s, which is to use the, um, the plastic kit, which is mm -hmm. the M60. Um, it was a lot harder to put to supply people with ERA bits to glue onto the outside of the tank. Right. So if we do it in the future, we've, we've been experimenting, we thought it would probably be easier just to do a r whole resin turret mm -hmm. and then one little metal bit that you glue to the front of the hole. So it's something we might actually release in the future, mm -hmm. but for both uh, the Israelis and the US Marines. So mm. yeah, so keep an eye out for that in the future. Lee Siok Wan asks, is the oil war book in line with the upcoming V4 rules, which I assume is the Team Yankee revised? Yeah, so Team Yankee version two um, will line a lot of the mechanics up with how V4 works, but none of those should affect how your, how your army box works. So right. oil war will work perfectly fine with either the current Team Yankee or Team Yankee version two, as will all their previous books. Yeah. Right. Why does the Chieftain lose two points of AT? Uh, for its inferior ammo, while other tanks only lose one. All oh, right. Well, that's kind of more the difference between different guns and different ammo. So, the Iranians they got supplied their chieftains in the seventies, and they came with seventies ammunition, which was um, armor-piercing, uh, discarding sabre rounds. Right. Uh, the stuff that the chief, the British have in their chieftains and their and uh, and their challenges later is um, is. Fin stabilized as well, so it's discarding sabo, fin stabilized, uh, and also, and that gives that, that gives it enough velocity, and it's also got improved improved penetrator as well than over the so it's a 1980s round versus a 1970s round, so it's that's why it's two points better in any okay. tank. Also, the guns I think he's referring to are the 105 millimeters used by the British and the Americans and the Germans. All the same gun, all British built L7 gun. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between the Americans, the Americans got anti-tank 20, and the British and the um, and the Germans all have anti-tank 19, mm -hmm. is because it's the uh, depleted uranium round gives you the extra penetration. So it's the same round. So it's a armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding saber round. But one. But it's got it's got a, a depleted uranium penetrator instead of tungsten instead of a tungsten penetrator. So right. That's just giving it a bit of extra penetration here. Yeah. Going back to the Iranians and their gun from the 70s, mm. well, why didn't they just buy oh, some new rounds? Because the British no wouldn't sell them the new rounds. Right, so did they just have a pile of 1970s ammo left over? Yeah, or they, did brought, they... they brought a whole heap around. The British also had the same problem. The British, when they first introduced the Chieftains, brought a whole pile of the same, or manufactured a whole pile of the same rounds. So a lot of the time when the British are training, they're not using... The real fin stabilised. They're just using the APDS rounds here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense then. I mean, I assume that no one was going to sell them brand new, super effective ammunition. Yeah. I thought some clever cookie would have figured it out for me. Well, I should, I should. I mean, I would think if they're still using the same gun now, the Iranians, because they they did a lot of reverse engineering. So in the '90s and 2000s, they you know reverse engineered a lot of stuff. They right. made they made their own toes and all that sort of thing. So they probably have 
Made a better round for the gun now, yeah. If they're still using that one, one two, two millimeter gun, yeah. All righty. One twenty millimeter, I should say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stuart Howells, how did you decide Oil War was the next feature over any other releases you could have made in the Team Yankee universe? Uh, well, that one we just decided we'd wanted to just a bit of change of scenery. Really, we wanted to expand the war out into another region. Just have a, a kind of rather than just. A, more European nations, like right. because you know the other uh, there's lots of people we haven't looked yeah, at. Yeah, what yet. else was on the cards? The on, on the cards was uh, doing like another NATO book with some more, like filling out the rest of the NATO forces, or doing another Eastern Front book and maybe putting things like Hungarians and Bulgarians and things like that mm -hmm. in it. But they are not going to be dramatically different from the Czechs and Poles and East Germans are already done. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we'll, at some point we'd like to have a look at the other Europe, uh, other European nations, but we'll. I don't know when we'll get get to those, but mm -hmm. we thought we'd do something, just expand the war a bit, have a bit more variety in it, have something a bit different. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And plus, Pete was quite keen to have do the Israelis, and then we get opportunity to do a Macabre, plastic Macava, yeah. which is a very cool cat. Yeah. Have you put one together yet? No, I haven't put one together. No. Chris really enjoyed it. Yeah. I think he's the first one to put one together. It's the one we put on the Instagram. Oh, I think Victor's already. Victor's already painted a whole he's army of whole, them. Whole company's almost almost finished painting. I think. Yeah. And they look fantastic. But Chris put one together weeks and weeks ago when I put one on Instagram and he made a real meal of it, sat aside and really savored putting it together. So that's good. Um, Peter Fisher, when you were looking at what if scenarios like oil war, how do you decide what to put in and what to leave out, both in terms of the nations and their equipment? Well, yeah, well, um, the easiest thing is to look at what they were fielding at the time. So you can usually, there's a lot of information online and in books and things about what particular army. I mean, some armies have more information than others. Mm -hmm. Kind of uh, extrapolate what they have. But then you've got to make some choices about, because like a good example, we talked about the um, Iraqis earlier and all the weird equipment they had. So we didn't put all that equipment in because a lot of the equipment was doing the same job. Right, yes. And so yeah. it, 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 doesn't make, it doesn't make a lot of sense to... Um, for, for us as a manufacturer of models to repeat too many of the same yep. models that do the same job in yep. the, for the one army because they're only gonna people are only gonna buy a finite number of that particular model. So having them buy three of each or something instead of um, nine or whatever they need. Yeah. 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 Doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So so like I was mentioning the Brazilian equipment, those armored cars and that we could have made those, but we decided to stick with stuff we'd already made. Um, just to make it easier easier to get the range out because it also anytime you make more models it takes yeah. longer to manufacture it and it delays things yeah and i suppose there's a similar consideration when it comes to deciding what nations go in a book because i'm in, yeah. a, in any given geographic region there's likely to be crossover of yeah well a couple equipment of people, a couple of people asked questions about all the other um, several, I think there's several questions about other Middle East nations. Well, the next one's about Jordan and yeah, the well, other Gulf actually, states yeah, from so, uh, Dean Andrew K. So let's segue into that question. Yeah, so basically we, uh, we it would have been cool to have all those, like having having Jordan and Kuwait and, and Saudi Arabia and all the stuff that's, you know, kind of around Iraq that later is sort of involved in the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. um, but we only had so much space. The, uh, Oil War is already our biggest Team Yankee book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we couldn't really we couldn't really crowbar any more in there, and of course that also expands how much time it takes, and also models again. Like Jordanians use a lot of models we already have, but I think they're by that point the, the infantry have changed. But we can't get away with the same infantry we use for uh, Fate of the Nation, right? So we'd have to do a new infantry range, and you know, yeah. So. But you can. There is one extra nation in oil war you can do syrians with yeah them. so basically we, we we've got a section in the book couple of pages just about syrians talking about you know, yeah. their role in world war three and then um and then suggesting how to field them which is basically just to use the iraqis and we've got a list of they're like iraqis but they they don't have the following things so you can't use these things. right yeah i mean other than that they're very similar to the iraqis the organization they're both both the iraqis and the syrians are very influenced by soviet organizations mm -hmm. and doctrine in actual fact, the Syrians probably stick to the Soviet doctrine more closely than the Iraqis right. do. But yeah. So sort of without being reductive, yeah. a lot of these things are very similar. Yeah. And so you could 
comfortably do one of these other Gulf states using the Syrian organization or the Iraqi organization? Yeah, yeah, because there was, I think there's some other questions there about uh, Palestinians, I think. So yep. Uh, asking how you could do Palestinians to fight the Israelis in, in southern Lebanon. Yep. Uh, one of my suggestions is you could use the besiege from the uh, Iranian army. Yep. And, and as like a... Basically as a kind of slightly irregular uh, sort of light infantry fighters, basically. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. So yeah, there's there's options and in, in, in a lot of it's down to the paint job you choose. You can sort yeah, of spruce much. them up how you like. Yeah. Um, Daniel P. Ward asks, Wayne, which two armies in oil war would you like to see fight out on the tabletop? Maybe we'll do this for a launch battle, maybe. Well, I mean, hopefully we've kind of lined things up in a logical manner. I mean, obviously, Iran and Iraq were having a war at the time. Yes. So, I mean, that's, that's you can actually, you know, with oil war, you can, you know, just fight Iran and Iraq war battles without even involving anybody else. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're, too, they're quite they're different from each other, but reasonably e- evenly matched. So, yep. yeah. So, so you get a lot of mileage out of that? I think so, yeah. yeah. Which one? I saw on a on a on the tabletop piece of war video. Does it was did the Iraqis have a leopards? They have allied leopards. Is Iraq who can take allied leopards? Yeah, well, because because in oil war, Iraq is technically yes NATO ally. Yes, because they were being supported financially by the Americans and the French were supplying them equipment. So we put them in the we put them in the Western sphere of influence. No. And because they that annoyed the Soviets and their relations had broken down with the Soviets, so 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 Syria, both Syria Syria had bit much better relations with the Soviets. So the actual real Soviet ally in the region is Syria, right? And then Iran, we've we've for Iran, who no one really liked, we've uh, we've had the Soviets kind of enforce their will upon the Iranians, right. to get involved. Yeah. Okay, and the and the the questions there is is one about a, a, a non-aligned segment but i guess a non-aligned iran lasts about 45 minutes yeah it I gets mean, steamrolled by the yeah, it's, it's, Soviets. Yeah, if a, if a global a global war is breaking out and they i think because of both of them are you know their resources and oil there's, there's it's obvious that, that other nations are going to get involved because yes. they, they want to have access to that yeah so the iranians have been handed a bit of a rum deal yes all right well Matthias Mora, will we see the involvement of more NATO forces in the Middle East? Maybe a little extra campaign or something expands the story of oil war. Well, at the moment we've got a we've got a, um, a page, a couple of pages in the book, it, having some suggestions how um, to involve some other nations. Well, we've gone for the obvious ones, like the ones who actually got involved in the Gulf War, so you know, America, Britain, France. Mm-hmm. are all uh, forces that you could easily put into into uh, oil war as a I mean the French have always have forces in North Africa and Central Africa mm-hmm. uh, and Americans are always willing to they've got a uh, their um, ready reaction force can kind of be redeployed and of course the British you know may they may be too busy in Western Europe or they may yep. have some spare troops they can send over yeah hmm um, and Ernst Udo Peters on the IDF Merkava One tank, is there any option to, to deploy them as armoured personnel carriers? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I looked into this a lot when we were doing the book, and um, the Merkava has got this reputation of being able to carry ten men in the back. But to do that, they have to remove all the ammunition storage. So then they only have, I think it's about thirty rounds in the turret, and that's all the ammunition they'd have if they cleared out, because they have a armoured the back bit with the back doors. Right is basically extra armored stowage for ammunition mm-hmm. and that's in the, and it's full of ammo racks normally so to actually get people in the back they have to take all the ammo racks out right and it was basically designed as an expediency in certain situations if they needed to um, get some people forward or to go and mostly to recover other tank crews so you drive up one that's been emptied out and then under fire they can they can evacuate Right. Wounded tank crews or a tank a crew from a tank that's been knocked out or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So it was uh, it was never intended to be used as an APC as such. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So don't don't So we don't haven't speak to we haven't allowed maybe. people to do that because just because it would be it would it would be the best of both worlds because we don't yeah, track be, ammo in Team Yankee yeah, or something. Yeah, so. exactly. You don't track ammo in Team Yankee so people would get the advantage of 
of being able to carry some infantry without the actual disadvantage of not being able to fire much. Right, okay. Seth Aaron Scheller, can you historically play the Iran-Iraq war or is it just fluff? No, you can. Well, I assume yeah, they have all the same kit. All the, all the stuff, all the organisation and the kit is based on what they had in the Iran-Iraq war for both the Iran Iranians and the Iraqis. So. Right, yeah. So just do it. Yeah. It'll be fine. Yeah. Dylan Rogers. Were there any lists that you were really keen on that you couldn't include, formations or things? Well, I ended up making a choice to combine the Revolutionary Guard and the Iranian Army together. Mm -hmm. But it would have been quite cool to do the Revolutionary Guards as a separate thing. So they're not the, not the besieged. The besieged are the, basically the volunteer militia. Mm -hmm. The Revolutionary Guards are a little bit more regular, but they're the official guardians of the revolution right so but they because they were they formed and during the revolution they got a little bit of army equipment and some army training and then eventually they developed into their own thing and, and they were the ones that usually got a lot of the either captured or purchased chinese equipment right so those guys have got ak-47s and soviet style machine guns and they're using you know bmp ones and mm -hmm. btrs and things and their tanks are usually T-62s or T-55s or whatever mm -hmm. they've captured off the um, off the Iraqis or purchased. I mean, they were making all sorts of weird purchases. Like they were buying, um, they brought uh, T-62s off the Libyans. Right. <laughs> as well as uh, getting like Type 69s and Type 59 tanks off the Chinese. Chinese. Yeah. Right. So they've got stuff from everywhere. Yeah. And I think, I think the Syrians might have even sold the Iranians uh some t62s as well yeah. well if you got to buy a whole bunch of t62s uh pierre allen le breton pierre allen le breton will there be other supplements to oil war such as panzer trippen or stripes or is it just a one-shot book one-time deal one trip um, at the moment it is yeah we hadn't we haven't thought too much it would be kind of cool to do more stuff as you're saying we're talking about all the other middle eastern middle nations and countries, stuff. Yeah. but uh not at the moment, but it may change. Yeah. And uh, the final question from Liam Arthur Ash Collins. The new nations allow for some unlikely allies and break the trend of NATO always being hit on 4+. This also allows NATO players to quite easily supplement their numbers quite extensively with Iraqis, compensating for what was otherwise a quite inherent NATO-wide shortcoming, low numbers. Are the Iraqis pointed with us in mind, or do the relatively small Iraqi formations and allied formation rules outweigh this? I think, yes, yeah, the second point there, that they've got quite reasonably small formations, and the allied rules mean that you know, they're not counting towards it, keeping the other army on the table. So if you break, so if they're allied with Americans and you break the Americans, the Iraqis are not hanging around. Right. They're leaving, because they're allies, they're leaving. Yeah, the game is over. So, right. Yeah. Um, also, I think it depends on the NATO force you're dealing with as well, because, you know, you take Americans taking M60s, M60s are not super expensive. You still get a lot of M60s in an American force. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of Humvees in an American force as well. Yep. Um, you, I mean, any, any of the NATO nations have Leopard 1s, so you get a reasonable number of Leopard 1s in a force. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I think not all the Western nations are like very small compact forces mm -hmm. yeah it depends on what you take yeah all right and that concludes our question and answer for oil war are you excited wayne are you excited to see the book yeah it's good it's good to, we've had the book for a, a little bit now it's, yeah well yeah it, we're, we're all ready it was, to cover to cover it was, it's pretty uh it's pretty cool i'm quite pleased with how it turned out yeah yeah all right fantastic there you go well timed <laughs> cheers